So today the, the sermon is entitled The Purpose of Apologetics. And we've been talking about an apologetic series all the way through. Okay, And today is the last sermon of the series. And you may be wondering a little bit why we're doing a sermon called The Purpose of Apologetics at the end of a series on apologetics. And it's that oftentimes we learn apologetics and then it takes us a couple of times of having conversations with non-believers or skeptics to learn how and why we should use apologetics. Usually it takes us a couple of times of screwing up before we really learn the purpose. So today we're going to try to figure out how to not screw up so much, so we're going to learn the purpose, okay? So with that in mind, 1 Peter 3, verses 13 through 17. Uh, okay, here we go. It says, Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. Having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Okay, so in the first verse here, the first word of the first verse that we get to is the word now. Okay, and verse 13, it starts out now. That word in Greek is actually a Greek word. It's called kai. Okay, and it's more oftentimes translated as and or but. Okay? In, our, in our Greek New Testament, in the New Testament that you see here, uh, it's more oftentimes translated as and or but. And if we remember back to our English class, this word chi in the Greek is a conjunction word. If we remember back to our English class, a conjunction word is, is something that connects two sentences or thoughts. Okay, So Peter, when he's writing this, and he uses this word chi, He's trying to connect what he's going to say to what he has said. So the question obviously arises, what did he need to connect? What, would, what did he say previously? Well, if we read, it's like verses 10, and 12, 10 through 12. If we read those verses, we're not going to read them. But if we read those, he quotes Psalm 34. And he quotes Psalm 34 to remind the readers of this letter that he wrote that God continually looks after and cares for the righteous. He continually looks after and cares for the righteous. So this Greek word kai is, is very important because it's, it's showing how Peter is connecting a promise that God made in, in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, to what he was writing to these readers who were facing stuff in their own lives. He's connecting one of God's promises in the Old Testament to everyday real life that the people who, who he's writing to in the first century A.D. are dealing with. So as we look at this passage and we read this passage, it's important that we keep in the back of our minds that the purpose of apologetics and how we're going to learn what the purpose of apologetics is important for us to remember that the promise that God makes to us is that he will always look out for us. So as it's talking about now, who is there to harm you if, you if you are zealous for what is good, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake? Talking about suffering, even though you've done good and you're going to do good. And we read that, and it's a difficult text. And even as we read it, we can keep in the back of our minds Psalm 34. He's going to protect us. He's going to look after us. We are His children. Okay, so let's read these verses again. But now we're going to stop at verse 15. Verse 13, it says, now, who is there to harm you, even if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. So as Peter continues his letter, we see that he's encouraging the readers of this letter to remember, that God, to remember God's promise that he made back in Psalm 34. 
And to remember that as he starts off this verse 13, that because of this promise, no one will be able to harm you. But that even if someone harms you, because they can, they've done it to Christians over in Iraq this, this week, but that even if they do harm you, they won't really be able to harm you. Because your life is not based on your current circumstances. This is what we talked about last week. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're standing before the burning, fiery furnace. And they go to answer Nebuchadnezzar and they say, we don't need to answer you, king. If we remember that lesson, then what we remember from them and what we learn from them is the same thing that the Christians are displaying in, in Iraq today. Is that even though you can harm my body, you can't harm what is God's. And God owns who I really am. So when we read these verses in, in 13 and 14, what we can read is, we can read it and it sounds really hard. It sounds really harsh. It sounds like, you know, honestly, me and Greg Antel were talking before the service and I was, and I was like, honestly, this is one of those pa- passages in the Bible that I'm like, I kind of wish it wasn't in the Bible. I kind of wish that it was like, Peter was like, ah, no, your life's going to be fine, you're a Christian. But no, it's not like that. It's in the Bible and it's in there because it's true. And we can agree with what Peter's saying right here because of examples like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because of examples like the Christians that are in Iraq being persecuted and beheaded right now. Because just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and just like the Christians who are in Iraq, if we are able to defend our faith to our, to our own doubts when we are suffering, then we can, as Peter says in these verses, have no fear of those who, who would harm us. Verse 15. Verse 15 says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. This word, defense, always being prepared to make a defense. This word in Greek, it's, it's the word apologia. Okay? Apologia. Uh, from which we get the word apologetics, and it's also where we get our word apology from, okay? So apology isn't just saying that you're sorry for something, it's supposed to be making a defense for something, okay? And it means to make a defense or to explain something. Apologia means to make a defense or explain something. So when Peter uses this phrase that we're always to be prepared to make a defense to anyone, he's explicitly telling us that it is our duty to know apologetics so well and know how to defend our faith to anyone that asks us for the reason for the hope that is in us. He's telling us to do these things and herein is the need for the sermon today. If we have been charged by the Holy Spirit through Peter with the duty of being able to defend our faith to anyone who may ask us to, how do we defend it? Well, so far this whole series has been talking about how we defend our faith. Apologetics, how we defend our faith. But another part of the question may be, why did Peter even make this statement to begin with? Sure, we need to know how to defend our faith, but why should we even have to defend it? When we're studying apologetics, we're finding out the how. When we're sitting down and we're reading a book on apologetics, or we're sitting in a class, or we're sitting around and we're sitting in the worship center listening to sermons on apologetics, we're figuring out the how. But today, we're only going to be talking about why. Why should we even learn this to begin with? So let's let's chat about what we oftentimes can think apologetics means. Okay? So we can't think, we must not think that. Providing a defense, when, when Peter says that we should be able to provide a defense, we can't think that that means that we need to be prepared to argue why God exists. When Peter was writing this in the first century A.D., it was a crime to be a Christian. And in most of the areas of Rome, it was punishable by death. So we know that through church history, that many people were put to death throughout the Roman Empire and throughout the rest of the world for being Christians, just as they are in Iraq today. What Peter probably meant then by saying we should be, able to, we should be prepared to make a defense is that 
whenever someone asks you why you believe in Jesus, you should be able to tell them. But since they were asking you and not trying to kill you, or not trying to turn you into the Gestapo, you should be able to, def- to defend what you believe or why you have the hope that your faith gives you in order to lead them to salvation. It's not just so that you can defend your faith, but it's so that it will lead them to salvation. This is why Peter says later on in verse 15, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason that is, for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. That's why he says do it with gentleness and respect because oftentimes what we can do is we can begin arguing about apologetics and we can win the argument but we can lose the person. So what we see in these verses is providing a defense for apologetics or providing a defense for apologetics was much different at the time that Peter was writing this letter than what we oftentimes assume it means in our American mind. Because in America... Persecution for believing in Jesus doesn't involve death. Instead, it's death in the public perception. It's it's your intellectual death. It's the death of your reputation, the death of your pride, and in many cases, the death of the American dream. All of these things that American culture holds most dear and holds as our what should be our topmost priority, Christianity is opposed to. So to combat this, many Christians falsely think that they have to be able to defend their worldview in order to oppose the slanderous verbal persecution that we receive in the media and public perception. All the while, when we do this, we're seemingly ignoring that Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount that we're blessed when people revile us, persecute us, and utter all kinds of evil things about us. He says that in Matthew 5. Then he goes on in Matthew 5, 12 to say that we should rejoice and be glad because our reward will be great in heaven. The problem, the problem is that we often think that we simply need to learn the answers to the questions that people will bring to us. But this isn't what Peter meant when he used the word apologia. Like I said before, back in this time, nobody was going to argue with you about if your belief was logical or not, and then decide if they were going to kill you. They were going to decide to kill you whether or not they cared if, if what you could argue. If someone wanted to, and back in this time period, in, in the first century AD, if someone wanted to look down on you or persecute you because you were a Christian, they wouldn't care if your belief was logical. They'd kill you no matter how much you were trying to argue. And in many cases in church history, we see that the reason that someone is killed is because they are speaking for Jesus. Church history tells us that Timothy, the Apostle Paul, he treats him as his own son. He calls him his own son. And, he, and he, he says to the church in Ephesus, he says, I'm sending you Timothy because I have no one like him. Okay? If the Apostle Paul, the guy who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, who established most of the early churches, if he says that he has no one like you, you're the bomb. Okay, that's just the truth. So he, he sends them Timothy, and church history tells us that, that, a, that a procession, a parade, was going to honor the, the goddess Diana, and that Timothy stood up, and that he started preaching the gospel, and that, what, the pagans repented? No. Church history tells us that they grabbed Timothy, they beat him, they drug him through the streets of the city, and they stoned him. Too often times, we use apologetics as a tool to defend why we can still be cool and be a Christian. Why we can still be considered by others as smart and be a Christian. Why we can be normal and be a Christian. But in the first century A.D., when Peter was using this word, apologia, there was little hope of you even being safe in being a Christian, much less you being normal. Truth 
that we need to commit ourselves to that we see in this text is that learning apologetics is for defending our faith through our own doubts, like we talked about last week. It's for breaking down the preconceived, biased notions that non-believers who ask us these questions bring to the table. And then, if we understand that, then their choosing to not believe in Jesus is completely because they didn't want to believe. And it's not because their logic kept them from believing something that, that, that appeared to be irrational to them. So today, in your notes, the first thing, apologetics is so that we can continue to live out our faith even during hardships and so that we can offer this faith to a non-believer despite any bias they may bring. So perhaps, perhaps, I'll leave it up to you guys, perhaps we need to rethink our purpose of apologetics and realize that it's not to defend our pride. It's not to defend our intellectual reputation or it's not even to defend God. It's to allow the unbeliever a chance to believe in something that otherwise his logic wouldn't allow him to believe in. So there's a book that I've been reading. It's called Moneyball. It's been made into a into a movie. Probably some of you have seen it. And the main character in the book, his name is Billy Bean. And he's the general manager of the Oakland A's. Still to this day, he's the general manager of the, of the Oakland A's. And it tells the story of how Billy Bean this general manager, in 2002, put a winning team on the field. He went to the playoffs with this team, and he did it for less money than any other team in the major leagues. Actually, at the beginning of that movie, it shows you kind of some of the comparison, and it shows the year before, the Oakland A's were playing the Yankees in the playoffs, and it shows that the Oakland A's spent $39 million, which is a lot, but the New York Yankees spent... $139 $139 million. So how did he do that? How did he do that? Well, it goes back to his past. Billy was a great high school talent, and he was widely sought after as a player. But unfortunately, when he went into baseball, he never panned out in the major leagues. And it tells you in this book, which you don't really see in the movie, but it tells you in this book that truthfully, Billy was never really interested in playing baseball. But that the scouts who scouted him and talked to him were more interested in getting him into baseball than he was. An older scout that actually ends up being on the Oakland A's staff uh, that he'd scouted, he'd actually scouted Billy when Billy was a kid coming out of high school. Uh, He gives some insight to how baseball scouts And he says this about Billy. He says, Billy was a guy you could dream on. The sad thing is that we can often be like baseball scouts. If we begin trying to get all the answers to every single question that a person may bring to us, and we can can start this study of, of all these different answers that we can provide to someone, and we can just... We can be studying and we can just dream of how we can use this information. And most of the time, we don't even question why we should learn this information. And if we don't question why we should learn this information to begin with, why we should learn apologetics to begin with, if we aren't careful, then our study of apologetics will will just like Billy Bean, who never panned out in the major leagues, our study of apologetics will never pan out into the glorification of God even though we know all the things that we should know, even though we may even have talent in arguing our point, it will never pan out into the glorification of God. And this is very easy to do, but it's not what the purpose of apologetics is. And just like we can be like baseball scouts, we can also be like general managers who can make decisions that can harm the team that they work for. If a general manager makes a dumb decision, it, it can affect the team for years. And just like they can affect a team for years, we can make a defense or an apologia in a way that is so harsh and disrespectful 
that ends up pushing someone away from the hope that we have inside of us instead of pushing them to the hope that we have inside of us, which is Jesus. So in your notes, next thing in your notes, no amount of sermons on apologetics can teach us all that we need to know to defend our faith. We have to devote ourselves to the study of it individually and as a church. No amount of sermons, no amount of sermon series can teach all of you all that you need to know about apologetics. We can't do it. Okay? Me and Jason and Pastor Tyler, we were all teaching during this sermon series on apologetics, and no amount of sermons can teach you guys all that you need to know on apologetics. So I am challenging each and every one of you to study individually. I'm challenging us as a church to have classes to study it together in, in, in small groups to dig in to what apologetics is, why we should learn it, and how. So Peter's telling us in this letter that, that apologia means something much deeper than just learning the rebuttal to any question that you may, be, you may encounter. Instead, it's a whole philosophy on how we should think about our faith. Because if we won't study apologetics to be able to defend our faith through our own doubts, like we talked about last week, if we can't defend our faith when we're standing in front of the... When, if we can't defend it to ourselves when we're standing in front of our burning, fiery furnace, then we probably won't have the right motive behind studying it to defend it to non-believers. And if we only study it so that we can argue or so that we can give the rebuttal to the question, we'll end up proving to people that what we believe in is logical, but we're but will scare them away from ever wanting to believe in it. Why? Because we haven't shown them the hope that is within us. All we've given them is an argument. We've, ju- we've, we've just tried to defend what we believe so that they won't think that we're intellectual cavemen. We haven't tried to defend what we believe so that it will lead them to salvation. If we think that we have to learn learn the rebuttal to every argument or every question that we can encounter, we can be fairly certain that we don't understand the purpose of apologetics. So in your notes today, it is not the purpose of apologetics to be able to answer every question a non-believer may ask. It is not the purpose of apologetics to be able to answer every question a non-believer may ask. And you may say, well, What is the purpose of apologetics if we shouldn't be able to answer the questions that are asked to us? And to that I'll say, let's look at a story in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John in chapter 18. Jesus is on trial. Okay, He's on trial and he's about to be sentenced to death by crucifixion. And right before Pilate takes him out and, and... presents him to the crowd, Pilate asks him one more question. One more question. Let's find out what that question is. It's in John chapter 18, verse 38. Pilate said to him, him being Jesus, Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. Most people in America, but not, not totally in America, it's not isolated to America, but particularly in America, want Christians to be able to defend their faith. And usually what they mean by that is that they want the Christian to prove that what they believe is true. But if this were the purpose of apologetics, if the purpose of apologetics what was just to prove what's true, then don't you think that Jesus would have answered Pilate And don't you think that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they're standing in front of the burning, fiery furnace, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king that can kill them or or save them, ask them to defend themselves, to to give an answer for their actions of not bowing down to the idol that he had set up, don't you think that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have answered him? But, I mean, sure, yeah, they're just just humans. It's just Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're just humans. But surely to goodness... 
Jesus, the Son of God, would have answered the question, would have answered any question that a non-believer had, right? He didn't. He didn't. Baker's Encyclopedia of the Bible says this about what truth is. Pilate asks, what is truth? Baker's Encyclopedia of the Bible says this. I'm going to have it up on the screen. While a general account of truth may be inferred from biblical data, remember, Pilate asked, what is truth? While a general account of truth may be inferred from biblical data, the focus of Scripture is upon soteriology, the revealed truth in the gospel of God's redeeming grace through Christ. This is the truth which Christ and the apostles proclaimed, which was foreshadowed in the Old Testament and witnessed to by the Holy Spirit. So the big word that it said in that, in that quote was soteriology. Soteriology, you guys may be wondering, what it, what, what's soteriology, Ryan? Soteriology is the study of how to be saved. Okay, It's how fallen humanity, it's how we know that fallen humanity gets redeemed, restored, and reconnected into a right relationship with God. So what this quote is saying is that while the Bible does generally account for what truth is, it makes a much bigger emphasis on who truth is. What this means for us is that we need to be able to put apologetics in its proper place. Like, in the whole scope of what Christianity is, we need to figure out where does apologetics fit in. And it's not to be our primary witnessing tool, as we oftentimes think it is. The gospel is to be our primary witnessing tool. And the sooner that we realize that Apologetics isn't supposed to have that place, the sooner we can begin to understand what the purpose of apologetics is. So in your notes, the purpose of apologetics isn't to prove truth. Instead, it's to provide a reason for the hope that we have. It's to point to Jesus, not to the answer to arguments. It's to show people Jesus not to show how smart we are. It's to show people Jesus, not why our worldview is the best. Don't you see? Don't you see why Jesus said this? Jesus could have answered why he didn't say anything. Jesus could have answered Pilate. But what Pilate couldn't see is that the truth was standing right in front of him. He was looking into the very eyes of what truth is. Jesus knew that, and Jesus could have provided the best argument. After all, he does know everything. Jesus knew that not even his standing before Pilate could have changed Pilate's mind. Pilate was searching for truth in philosophy, but was, but was not willing to put his hope in Jesus. He was, he was willing to put his hope in abstract ideas, but he missed the truth when he was staring it right in the eye. And he missed it because he was so concerned with abstract. So in your notes today, the sad but honest truth is that many are looking for truth, and that search blinds them from seeing Jesus. Many people want to argue philosophy. Many people. And if we just try to argue back with them, then lots of times we could end up running philosophical circles and never get around to Jesus. In the end, Jesus, like I said, he could have made the best argument ever, but he was quiet. So why and how could we ever try to explain something that Jesus himself didn't try to? So, last thing in your notes today. In the end, this is why we need to study apologetics. The purpose of apologetics is to, and I've got a little list, defend our faith to our own doubts. What we talked about last week, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're standing in front of their burning, fiery furnace. The only way they're going into that furnace is if they can have doubts that pop up in their mind and then they can defend their faith to their own doubts and it abolishes that doubt. Then they go in the furnace. 
The purpose of apologetics is to defend our own to, to defend our own faith, to our own doubts. It's also to tear down the bias of non-believers. People will when they come and they want and they and they want you to provide a defense for the reason that that the hope that's in you. They'll bring they'll come to you with bias. They'll come to buy with a bias to the table. And that's why you need to know apologetics, so you can tear down that bias. Okay? So the next thing is the purpose of apologetics is to reveal to non believers that what we believe requires faith. Just like what they believe. Because if you study apologetics and, and you can you can get into a into an argument with a non believer, and when you study it all down, it still requires faith. Every worldview requires faith. If there was if there wasn't a requirement of faith, why would Jesus talk about faith so much? Wouldn't that be a waste for the time that he has here on earth? He only had three years in ministry. I don't think he would have wasted any of his words. So the next thing, the last thing in your notes today, the purpose of apologetics is to reveal to non-believers that our hope is not in the abstract idea of truth, but it's in the fact that Jesus Christ truly died on the cross for our sins and that he rose three days later in victory. And when we approach apologetics thinking that we need to be able to answer every single question that a, purpose, that a person may ask us, it becomes a very daunting challenge. And I'm not telling you guys, I'm not telling you guys that, and I'm not telling you guys at all that you don't need to learn some of these answers. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that Learning all the answers isn't the reason, and, and it isn't a good enough reason to learn apologetics. Knowing all those answers, knowing the rebuttals to the questions, isn't the purpose of apologetics. And neither is the very fact that the questions are being asked a good enough reason to merit our study of apologetics. The proper reasons for learning apologetics are what we just wrote down in the notes, and they're up on the screen today. Those are the proper reasons for learning apologetics. And when we know how to th- when we know why we study apologetics, we can better put into effect how to use those apologetics. And when we better put into effect how to use those apologetics, we can use those apologetics and it results in glorification of God, which is in the end our chief purpose of being here. You know, before C.S. Lewis became a Christian, he's a Christian writer, wrote lots of Christian books, wrote, you know, famous author of Chronicles of Narnia. Before he became a Christian, uh, he was friends with J.R.R. Tolkien. Okay, J.R.R. Tolkien, author, Lord of the Rings, a bunch of movies. If you've got like two days to devote to watching movies, I suggest Lord of the Rings. Okay, so, but anyway, before C.S. Lewis was converted, he and J.R. Tolkien were friends and colleagues at, o- at Oxford. And before his conversion, C.S. Lewis would spend hours arguing how Christianity was false with Tolkien. Tolkien was a Christian. Tolkien would argue how Christianity is true. Lewis was an atheist and would argue how it's false. And in the end, Tolkien and Lewis had a conversation one night. And in the end, C.S. Lewis had to do some studying for himself. He had to have lots of conversations with Tolkien. But in the end, C.S. Lewis was converted when? When Tolkien made the best argument and C.S. Lewis was like, ah, you got me. No. C.S. Lewis was converted while he was alone riding a motorcycle on the way to the zoo. And, and he, he literally says, and, and, and I think it's his son writes the biography of him, and he had, he had told that, that C.S. Lewis, his friends called him Jack. I don't, I don't know. Okay, That's like, hey, my name's Ryan. My friends, my friends call me Chuck. I don't, I don't understand it. But they called him Jack. He says that, that Jack said that he got on to the motorcycle an atheist and that he got off the motorcycle the most reluctant Christian out of London. So in closing, let me say this. Just a minute ago, I said that when we study apologetics, we can better put into effect how to use those apologetics, which results in God being glorified. 
let me tell you what I, what I mean by how to better use apologetics. And I'll use the example of Tolkien with Lewis. Tolkien could defend his faith, right? He did defend his faith to Lewis. But in the end, it wasn't Tolkien's ability to defend his faith that converted Lewis. It was God. However, Tolkien did know how to defend his faith, didn't he? And because of that, Tolkien made himself a willing tool to be used by God. And God chose, because of this tool, he chose to use this tool, Tolkien, he chose him to use it to break down some of Lewis's bias. Because Lewis had been through War I, and when Lewis was in War I, he, he, he swore to himself that the atrocities that he saw meant that there could never be a God, and if there was a God, that he was evil. Tolkien had huge bias brought to the table. Or Lewis had huge bias brought to the table, but Tolkien was able to be the tool by which God broke down those biases. No part, I'm going to make this very clear as we close out this series on apologetics, no part of apologetics will ever be able to reach a human being by itself. Only God can reach a human being and save them. No part of no no amount of reason or rational argument can do that. In the end, what allowed what allowed Lewis to be saved was God and God's tool, Tolkien, and the friendship that Tolkien had with Lewis, rather than the arguments that Tolkien was ever was able to make. To Lewis. Now, like I said before, does this mean that Tolkien didn't know, didn't have to learn apologetics? No, because if he hadn't learned apologetics, he wouldn't be the tool by which God used to save Lewis. Would apologetics just have made the difference if him and if Tolkien and Lewis weren't friends at all, and Tolkien and Lewis would just meet and debate and hash it out? Would that have made the difference? Probably not. As we learn and as we study apologetics, let us remember what the purpose of apologetics is. And as we remember what the purpose of apologetics is, it shows people the reason behind our hope. It shows them the hope that we have in our faith. It shows them the relationship that our faith brings, which, by the way, all of us be good friends. Because when you're good friends, you show the relationship that Jesus has with you to that other person. That's what Tolkien did with Lewis. But Tolkien would have said, no, you're not a Christian. All you want to do is argue. I don't like you. Get away from me. If he would have said these things, he wouldn't have been displaying the relationship that he has with Jesus. So, as we study apologetics, let us remember what the purpose of apologetics is so that we can show the reason behind our faith, so that we can show the hope that we have in our faith, so that we can show the relationship that it brings, and so that we can show the forgiveness that it purchases.